Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so today's talk is about veganism, facts versus fiction. But before I start, can everyone see me? Because I can't see anything with the light in the way. Yeah. Can you see? Okay. Before I start, I just want to say I'm, I've been studying nutrition and um, I, I'm actually been studying nutrition for around 20 years and I've recently written a few books about it, more specifically sports nutrition and bodybuilding. And I'm just going to show you a couple of the books that I've done. I've actually got a third one coming out. And feel free to, I'm going to pass this around. This one is, it's actually about bodybuilding, this one. It's so big, you have to actually be a bodybuilder to actually lift it up. <laughs> but you can feel free to have a look at that, pass it around. And this one is called Lean Gains. And as the name suggests, it's for those who maybe want to lose a little bit of fat, gain a little bit of muscle, ideally both, right? So this one is called Lean Gains. Feel free to <coughs> circulate. Now I'm going to be doing quite a few talks over the next coming two years about various topics. So today I'm obviously talking about veganism. Um, so, you, you know, you, veganism is a fashionable thing now. More and more people are becoming vegan, am I right? Everyone I talk to is becoming vegan these days. Yeah? Either they're becoming vegan or they know somebody who's becoming vegan. In the last two years alone, three and a half million people in the UK have converted to veganism. Now, why is that? This is going to be an interactive talk, so feel free to interject. <coughs> Hello? Yeah, feel free to interject. So, why do you think that there's more vegans now? Well, I think it's also like the um, way the animals are being fed, with what they're being fed, and also a lot of it being less. How, ma yeah, how, many people, how many people have seen What the Health? Yeah. yeah, it's a very popular documentary on Netflix. Cowspiracy, um, Eating Our Way to Extinction, Knives Over Forks. There's so many documentaries now. And there's also a lot of very famous people like Ellen DeGeneres who actually talks about veganism. There's uh, Bill Clinton, there's Beyonce. They're all becoming vegans, they're all advocating veganism. So obviously that's going to have a very, very strong influence on whether or not the general public become vegan, or should I say people within the general public become vegan. So, what is veganism? Who can describe veganism without looking on the screen? Absolutely, yeah. So, according to the Vegan Society, veganism is a way of life which basically seeks to exclude all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals um, for food, clothing, or any other purpose. And that also includes, for those really strict vegans, honey. You can't eat honey if you're vegan, right? So, there, I want to basically clear something up. A vegan diet is not necessarily the same as a plant-based diet. Most plant-based diets are obviously vegan diets, but theoretically you can eat chips all day and call yourself a vegan. So I'm referring today for really with plant-based diets as opposed to vegan diets. Is that making sense? Okay. So we've already touched on that. Why are people becoming vegan these days? Health concerns about meat. Am I right? There's also the ethical standpoint. You know, it's, it's the way the animals are being treated. Obviously, that's, um, that's a concern for a lot of people. Then there's spiritual slash religious reasons. I personally was brought up as a Seventh-day Adventist. Who's heard of Seventh-day Adventists? SDAs? There just happens to be one in front of me. <laughs> um, who are notoriously vegetarian, or at least they were, most of them are vegetarian. Now, there's not one doctor in the world who would not advocate at least incorporating some kind of fruits and vegetables into your daily diet. Now, do you know why that is? Why are vegetables so great? What's so great about plant-based foods? Yep, vitamins and minerals, fiber, oh, digestibility, sorry, yes, digestibility. Yep, fiber. Basically, there's been a plethora of health benefits relating to plant-based foods, or shall I say, vegetables and raw foods as well. And um, 
you know, we're looking at a reduction of cancer, reduction of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, uh, inflammation, as in general inflammation, systemic inflammation, um, gut problems, autoimmune disease, tooth decay, all these things tend to be reduced quite significantly when you go plant-based diets. It doesn't mean you have to be 100% plant-based diets, but at least incorporating plant-based foods into your diet will significantly reduce these diseases. Next slide, please. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm basically going to be talking about 10 plant-based foods um, to really highlight my point that I've just made. Now, there are millions of others, okay? So I don't want anyone saying, well, what about this? What about that? I'm literally picking 10 plant-based foods which I believe that we should consume on a daily basis. And I, when, when I get to the end, you'll understand why these foods are very important. So, remember Popeye? Spinach, yeah? Now, spinach... These are just some of the benefits of spinach. Okay? And you're going, to see a, you're going to see a pattern as I go through. Um, you're going to see all the benefits of basically these vegetables. But spinach contains something called alpha-lipoic -lipo acid. Now, alpha-lipoic acid is very good for reducing hunger pangs. Now, do you know one of the things that causes hunger? Spikes in your blood glucose, you know? Spikes in your insulin levels. So if you have, for example, fast food, your insulin levels go whoop, whoop, your blood sugar levels go up and down, up and down, and then you end up becoming really hungry after half an hour. Who's ever had that? Who's ever had a, um, a, bowl, of, a bowl of chips? And then you feel really full up initially, and then you feel hungry an hour later. Anyone ever had that? Or is it just me? <laughs> it's usually because of these up and down spikes. Alpha lip that, that basically, what, this, what spinach does is it helps to reduce these pangs for a number of reasons. That's one reason. Um, also, the fact that it's rich in fiber, like a lot of these um, plant-based foods I'm going to be talking about. It contains chlorophyll. Now, who knows about chlorophyll? What are the benefits of chlorophyll? Just shout out, anybody. Oh, where, do you find, where do you find chlorophyll? Where do you find chlorophyll, mainly? Okay, that's right. Chlorophyll is absolutely incredible when it comes to detoxifying the body. Okay, it cleans out the... Um, yeah, it says it right there, doesn't it? <laughs> Um, helps to reduce the effects of heterocyclic amines. Now, I don't want to get too technical, but classically, when you um, overcook certain types of meats, chicken, and fish, um, especially if you barbecue, then what happens is you produce something called heterocyclic amines, which are carcinogenic. Now, what chlorophyll does is it actually mops it up. It actually basically detoxifies the body. And any, do you know who knows what free radicals are? Free radicals, okay. What's, what's wrong with, what are free radicals? But what, what exactly are they? Like, how, what, what effect do they have on the body? They basically um, kills your uh, cells. Yeah, they're like, uh, think of it like, um, like machine guns that are going around and shooting up all the cells in the body. Basically, they're very, very bad for you. Okay? They can contribute towards cancer and many other diseases. And um, then, the, what's the opposite of a free radical? What gets rid of free radicals? Who knows? Yeah. Antioxidants, yeah. <laughs> So um, spinach, again, it's very rich in antioxidants. Um, it's rich in uh, vitamins, potassium, which is also helps to regulate blood pressure. Next, let's go on to the next what one. Causes free what causes free radicals? A lot of the time, there's so many things. There's, um, if you have processed foods, a lot of the time, there's if you overcook uh, certain types of meats, so that's the amines, which is like a form of free radical. Obviously smoking, drinking too much, Oxidative things like that. Stress. Oxidative stress, absolutely, yeah. Um, which some people will say is born on by very high sugar diets. Um, and uh, Carol, I know that you're an expert when it comes to oxidative stress. Yeah, she is. She's a. Uh, but um, what, 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 what else causes oxidative stress? Toxins. Toxins, yep. Yeah, too, too much oxygen. Yeah, okay. Yep, aging. Okay, so who eats Brussels sprouts? I, I'm one of the few people who actually enjoys Brussels sprouts. I really love Brussels sprouts. They, they, you can eat to your heart's content. Because they're very low in calories. So if anyone's trying to lose weight, it's a great way of losing weight because it's very rich in fiber as well. Now, you know that fiber helps to keep you full up. And so you can eat, you can eat Brussels sprouts all day, really, and, and not worry about gaining calories and fat. Very powerful antioxidant. It contains something called kaamphorol. Kaamphorol, a very, very potent an, um, anti antioxidant. So it helps to kill off those free radicals that we were talking about earlier. Again, a bit like spinach, it helps to regulate blood sugar levels. I hope that you're starting to see 
a pattern forming. You will see it more as I go on. Radish. Now, radish is very rich in sulfur. Sulfur, guess what sulfur is really good for? It's a bit like antioxidants. Helps to mop up those free radicals. Helps to get rid of those, um, especially for the liver. It's really good for keeping the liver nice and clean. Um, reduces the risk of atherosclerosis. Now, who knows about atherosclerosis? What causes atherosclerosis? But what is atherosclerosis? Yeah, exactly. It's when the wall becomes weak. And the artery wall is actually consists of collagen, as well as many other things. But collagen is the main thing that makes up the artery wall. And surprise, surprise, because it's rich in vitamin C, it helps to make a lot of collagen. And the collagen obviously makes the arterial walls much stronger. And hence, it long-term reduces the effects of atherosclerosis. Um, there's loads of other things it does as well. But one of the things is healthier skin, right? Healthier skin. Um, and that's because of its vitamin C content. Again, vitamin C is used to make collagen, and collagen is used to answer, finish, the, finish the sentence. Go on. <laughs> it's, it basically makes the skin much firmer. Kale. Who likes kale? What's so good about kale? Why does everyone keep going on about how great kale is? Hmm? What's, what's the one thing that all of these vegetables have in common? Antioxidants, uh, high fiber, um, helps to detoxify the liver. Okay. Now, the liver, you, you can't live without the liver, right? The liver is very important. So we have to make, to make sure that we look after our livers. And that's why the vegetables, whenever you might, your parents would say, eat your vegetables, there's a reason why. Because, you know, there's so many benefits. Helps with digestion because it's rich in fiber. Those who are on a diet, they can eat kale and tend to feel full up much quicker. Am I right? Okay. Cabbage. Cabbage again. What's so great about cabbage? Are you starting to see the pattern here? High in fiber, antioxidants. Um, it also contains something, especially the red cabbage, contains something called anthocyanins. Now, anthocyanins, you tend to find them in uh, pigment. It's like a dark blue color. You tend to find them in like uh, colored fruits and vegetables like blueberries, blackberries. Red cabbage contains a hell of a lot of anthocyanins. Anthocyanins actually helps the brain. Um, you know, have you ever had brain fog before? You know, Hel helps, helps you think better, helps you increase your memory. Um, there's something called a blood-brain barrier. Who knows what the blood-brain barrier is? You know the blood-brain barrier? I'm relying on you, Carol, to fill it. OK, basically, blood-brain barrier, certain, when it, when it comes to the brain, not, not all nutrients can naturally make it to the brain, if that makes sense. It's got like a little filter. And um, so there are certain things like anthocyanins can actually go through this filter and make the brain basically affect the brain more directly. And so what that does is it actually goes in, it bypasses the blood-brain barrier and it helps to remove any toxins. And hence it's a very powerful antioxidant for the brain as well as the rest of the body. Next, asparagus. Again, look how many vitamins it's got. Loads of vitamins, it's packed to the brim of vitamins, rich in fiber, antioxidants. You're starting to see the pattern now, right? Antioxidants, fiber. Um, it has aphrodisiac qualities for, I don't really have to explain what aphrodisiac qualities are, but you get the idea, right? <laughs> okay, next on that topic. Um, who remembers sulfur? Who remembers what I said about sulfur? What's so great about sulfur? Yep, it, it helps to de-cleanse the body, it helps to um, detoxify the liver, more specifically. So it really does specialise in detoxifying the liver. And in garlic, we have something called allicin. Allicin contains a lot of sulphur. And it's actually responsible for a lot of the health benefits of garlic. Who likes garlic, by the way? I love garlic. <laughs> garlic, is gar garlic is also often used in the treatment, or should I say the prevention of Alzheimer's disease. It contains something called, okay, a bit of a mouthful, s -L 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 cysteine or we call it SAC. And basically what that does is it helps, when it goes into the brain, it basically helps to uh, reduce free radical that attack the brain directly. So hence, you know that Alzheimer's a lot of the time is caused by toxins and free radicals and things like that. So again, it, it does have a beneficial preventative effect when it comes to Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Can you find that in an allicin supplement? Yeah. Yeah. So you have 
Yeah, yeah it's, it's very famous for that. It's the sack and the sulfur, yeah, absolutely. Um, although I always say it tends to be, it's, it's always better to eat the food, to be honest with you, if you can. But, you know, supplements are better than not taking anything. Spirulina is more of a supplement, to be honest, although it's a blue-green algae. You tend to, most people tend to buy it as a supplement. And um, it's got a plethora of health benefits. Who have, how many people have ever had spirulina? Yeah? Oh, well. You, you can tell me about all the benefits of it all. But high-quality protein, beta, uh, B1 vitamins. Again, it's rich in chlorophyll, which helps to remove the toxins from the body. Uh, it also contains a, a, a very potent anti um, antioxidant called phycocyanin. You know phycocyanin? Remember what I said earlier about the anthocyanins, uh, anthocyanins that you find in red cabbage and blueberries? They tend to be very pigmented colour, so they, they tend to be like a bluish uh, green colour, like a really strong colour. And anything like that tends to be really good at antioxidants, I have really good antioxidant qualities. So in this case you have something called phycocyanin, very very potent antioxidant. You're seeing the patterns now with all these foods, yeah? So, next please. Now these are more spices. Now you know about the benefits of turmeric, right? Who knows about the benefits of turmeric? Yeah? What's so special about turmeric? You can now tell me. Have a guess. Antioxidants, yeah? Absolutely. Absolutely. But what's the downside with turmeric? Well, what's, what, what's, what's, what, what, what makes turmeric work, first of all? It's, it's something called curcumin. Curcumin, that's the active ingredient. What's the downside of curcumin? It says it on the right side of the screen. Yeah, it's not easily absorbed, so it needs a bit of help, basically. So, have you ever heard that, you know, with curcumin, it's best if you have pepper? Is that a bit of, have you heard that before? No. Okay, you've heard that, right? Yeah. So, with turmeric, you should have pepper, basically, because pepper contains something called piperin. And piperin helps the absorption of curcumin into the body. Am I okay with time, by the way? Am I okay with time? Yeah, but well, it's music and entertainment after. Okay, cool, cool. I just don't want to like run over it. And yeah. comedy. Comedy, okay. I'm, I'm not that funny, but yeah, it's a joke, bad joke. Okay, so move on. Cinnamon, okay. Who likes cinnamon? I love cinnamon. Who loves cinnamon? Good, I'm not the only one. Again, you can see the pattern, rich in antioxidants. Um, it also helps to improve insulin sensitivity. And that's really good because, again, it helps to reduce the hunger pangs. Because remember what I said earlier about the blood glucose up and down, up and down? It helps to kind of stabilize that, okay, uh, through something called alanines, which I'm not going to go into now. But basically, it helps to stabilize the insulin. And um, it's also antifungal, okay? So anyone with thrush, it tends to help to reduce the incidence of thrush. Um, antibacterial, antiviral. And, um, yeah, as I said, because of the more stabi stable effect it has on insulin release, which is, in other words, stable blood glucose levels, it tends to reduce the craving that you have for sugary foods. Yeah. Uh, and it's basically, it's basically this ingredient here, the cinnamaldehyde, which is, which is in the cinnamon. That's like the active ingredient. But I always say it's always best to go to the original source if possible. Um, okay. So, is that all making sense? Okay. That's just 10, you know, that's just 10 random vegetables. There's so many more, you know, but that's just 10. So it just goes to show the power of uh, plant-based foods, really, and how if you don't have plant-based foods in your diet, or at least if you don't have vegetables in your diet, then you do have a very strong chance of, at some point, suffering from one of those aforementioned diseases, right? So if that's the case, no, you went to... <laughs> if that's the case, why is it so... There, there's a lot of people who can't tolerate... Uh, veganism or vegetarianism, um, and then there are other people who thrive on it, right? Everyone here is vegan, right? Vegetarian. Vegetarian, okay. But then there are people out there who, who can't, can't tolerate it. Who knows about Angelina Jolie? Angelina Jolie, okay, you can go on the next screen now. Angelina Jolie, sorry. Um, she tried it and she hated it, and apparently the first thing she did is bite into a big steak after like four or five weeks or something of doing vegan, she couldn't do it basically. She said it almost killed her. But, but the, point, the point here is that there are things to look out for. And that, that, I think that's really what I'm trying, that's the point I'm trying to make here. So, who's heard about the protein argument? Vegans don't eat enough protein. You heard that one, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, it's a big one, isn't it? Do you mind if I have some water? Sorry, I'm getting a bit of a drop. 
Yeah, so, so the protein's a very big one. Protein, um, and there's so much to it because, first of all, is there truth to that? Are vegans getting enough protein? Yes. Yes. It's yes. Not really no, it's not. Absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on that. So, so really, it's a, it's a difficult question to ask, be, answer because it depends on what you do. Yeah. Now, I'm, if, if, you've heard, if you've ever heard of any of my previous talks, I often quote a guy called Lyle McDonald. Who, I don't know if anyone's heard of Lyle McDonald. He's like a sports nutritionist guy. If you go into the next screen, then we'll go back to that. But basically, he came up, he said that basically how much protein you need depends on what you do. If you're very sedentary, you don't really go out much, you don't, you, maybe you work on computers and go to bed, that kind of thing then you tend not to need as much protein as someone, for example, who lives in the gym or is trying to grow muscle because you do need protein to grow muscle. Okay? So someone, for example, who's a, who's a bodybuilder will have higher protein requirements than someone who has never been to the gym in his life. Yeah, you with me? And also it depends on the size of how big you are as well. So all these things come into how much protein you need. As a general rule of thumb, we say that one gram per pound of protein is sufficient for most people. But some people don't need that much. And then there's other things you're going to look at in, in, is, is absorption, how much protein is absorbed. Because we actually don't utilize all the protein that we eat. We actually urinate some of it out. But that's another, I'm going to talk about that in another seminar. But the point is that how much protein that you need or how much protein you need might not, might not be the same as how much I need. Okay, so that's one thing that, that we're going to look into. Jonathan, what kind of life, if you've got a, um, an average life, what type of amount of protein do you need? When you say average, you mean if you don't... I'm going to say that most people should take one gram per pound. What would that look like? What would one gram be in... Well, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to go into that now, actually, because remember I said about IKEA? Remember that IKEA example? Protein is a great analogy of that. So protein is the cupboard that you see in IKEA. You like that cupboard. It's, it's, around, it's massive. It's a massive cupboard. You can't put it in your car. So you have to break it down okay, and bring it into those packages, take it home, and then you build it again. And that's exactly what the body does. The body basically consumes protein. Now, who knows what amino acids are? Amino, amino acids make up protein. Yeah? Amino acids is basically the cupboard in packages. You with me? So what happens is that the human body is amazing because the human body will basically consume the protein that it needs break it down to the amino acids, and then, once it's in the form of amino acids, it will take those amino acids and form the protein that it sees as important. Now, that's probably not making that much sense, so I'm going to use an analogy. Let's say, that you, let's say that you go to the gym and you want to get bigger, and you want to make more muscle, but you're not eating enough protein. Well, before, I, before I say anything, actually, what is protein used for? What's so, what's so special about protein? Yep, it's used for muscles, but it's also used for all these other things as well. It's used to make skin, it's used to make hair, nails. Every single cell in the body needs protein. It's, it's needed to make hormones, antibodies, um, blood clotting factors, neurotransmitters, which basically helps you form nerve, sig nerve signals. It's used for energy, it's so many functions, as well as muscle growth. Now, whenever you read the magazines, all they talk about is muscle growth but they don't really talk about all these other things. It's, we will die without protein. Without protein, we'll die. So, bearing that in mind, if you're not eating enough protein, will the body prioritize growing new muscle over, for example, hormones or enzymes? What do you think? Well, yeah. it's not, basically, what the body is saying is, it's more important that I have functioning enzymes to stay alive. I've got to have the antibodies, the blood coats. That's more important than growing bigger biceps. Does, does it, are you with me now? Yeah. So, when it comes to actual bodybuilders, they tend to need more protein because they want to get bigger biceps. If there's enough left over after all this, then the body will start to make more bigger biceps. Are you with me? So, I, hope that, I don't know if that answers your question, but it very much depends on what you do with your life, basically. If you're very active and you're, you're working out a lot and all that kind of thing, which is kind of what my book's about, then your protein requirements tend to be higher. Next slide. Now I'm going to go a little bit deeper. I'm going to talk about the different types of amino acids. I don't want to go into too much detail, but remember I said that amino acids is, is the um, building block of proteins. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Have I lost anybody, by the way? Are you all with me? No, Are you sure? It's like a piece of, uh, for example, a piece of brown bread. It's 
is half amino acid. And if you add beans to that, it creates one amino acid. Yeah, that that's right. Protein. Yeah, because I, I think that's, I'm, I'm kind of getting on to that. Yeah, because there's um, something called complete proteins as well. So, so what you have is you've got a total of 20 amino acids. Now, we all, we, nine, nine amino acids we actually need to consume from diet. Okay? They're called essential amino acids. You with me? You know about essential amino acids? So in other words, we cannot, there's certain amino acids we cannot make. We have to take from, from protein sources. The rest we can actually, our body can make. So out of the nine amino acids, there's one called leucine. Who's heard of leucine? Okay, leucine is basically the most important amino acid if you want to grow a muscle. And this is where people get confused. And this is where the big argument, you go on YouTube, are uh, vegan um, protein supplements, they don't eat enough protein. This is where it all really comes down to is leucine. Because leucine is an amino acid that is absolutely essential for growing muscle. It's really hard to grow muscle if you don't have enough leucine. Okay? Now, the, the fact is, that whey protein, which obviously is not suitable for vegans, contains a hell of a lot of leucine. And that's where people get a, you know, a, bit, a bit defensive. Is that because whey protein contains so much leucine, then it's much easier to grow muscle when you have the whey protein. You with me? So if you're into bodybuilding, that's actually one of the most popular supplements out there is, is whey protein. And also you've got the uh, branch chain amino acids, which also contains a lot of leucine. So what about vegan protein supplements? Yeah? You tend to find that soy, rice, and pea protein are actually quite good sources of leucine, but you don't find as much as you do in the whey protein. You with me? So you need to have more of that if you want to have as much as with the whey protein. Is it all making sense? Okay. Does that clarify the whole protein argument? I should say, really. Uh, vegetables, don't, not a lot of them have complete proteins. Now, remember I said earlier about the nine amino acids that are essential? That's what we call complete proteins. And I think I mentioned it on here somewhere, but or maybe it's on the next slide. Is it on the next slide? Go back, go back, go back. No, 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 okay, maybe I don't mention it. But basically, we're looking at, again, it's um, only a handful, like you've got soy, you've got quinoa, you've got, um, I think, temper, am I right? Or corn? Is it the previous one, yeah? Previous, before, yeah, that one. yeah, yeah, that's right. So you've got quinoa, corn, soy, and tempeh. They tend to have complete proteins. So they have all the nine essential amino acids. But they don't have it in a lot of volume. The, the reality is that if you would have a liver, okay, eat liver contains all the amino acids you need. Loads and loads of amino acids. But it's obviously not suitable for vegans. So vegans tend to need more of these products in order to satisfy their protein requirements. The only downside with that is that a lot of these plant-based foods are rich in fiber. You with me? So you're going to feel full up before, you, especially if you're a bodybuilder, you're going to feel full up before you hit your requirements, which is why so many vegan bodybuilders take supplements. Yeah? Is that making sense now? Yeah. In order to get their requirements, which is roughly one gram per pound. Um, good. You can imagine if someone's really big. I've seen so many vegan bodybuilders, very big people. They need a lot of protein, but they just can't get enough from the food alone, so they, they take the vegan supplements. In fact, there's someone in this room who sells vegan supplements, doesn't there? <laughs> okay. Okay, I, I, kind of, I was going to ask you a question. What's the other thing that people keep talking about when it comes to vegan slash deficiency? Uh, B12. Quark deficiency. Oh. Yep, B12. B12, calcium. Calcium, yep. You get a lot of calcium in spirulina, by the way. 26 times more than milk. And omega-3. Mm -hmm. Omega-3, yep. That's, that's what I was going to say, omega-3. What's the, what's the big deal about omega-3? Uh, because that comes from like, the fish. Okay, but what's, what, what is... You know that uh, there's... Well, you think for the joints your brain? Yep, it's got, it's got a, a plethora of health benefits. Now, why is it that some people say that flax seeds have omega-3, yeah. um, and yet the other people say that you don't get enough omega-3 from plants? Because you need to convert it from flax. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. You've got alpha, okay, next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, okay, these are the benefits of, of, of omega-3s, okay? But however, however, as you rightfully said, um, there's three types of omega-3s. And I think a lot of people get confused because... Um, okay, I'm going to go back to that slide. But these are basically the benefits of omega-3s. Now, alpha-linoleic -lino acid, 
And then you've got icose to pentanoic acid, and then you've got docose to hexanoic acid, right, which is the DHA and the EPA and the ALA. Now, the ALA, as you said, is a, is a form that you tend to find in a lot of um, vegetables like, um, and, and vegan sources, like, for example, flax seeds, chia seeds, and um, hemp seeds, and things like that. So when people say hemp seeds are rich in omega-3, what they're really saying is they're rich in ALA. However, ALA is not that great for humans because we lack the enzyme to convert it into the active components, which is the EPA and the DHA. So the EPA and the DHA is, are basically responsible for 99.9% .9 of the health benefits from omega-3. You with me? Okay, that's an exaggeration. There are, there are health benefits from ALA, but most of the health benefits come from the, EHA and the EPA and the DHA. Is that all making sense? Yeah. Are you sure? So, you can eat all the flax seeds you want, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to give you all the benefits that omega-3, for example, from fish oils would have to give you. Now, the omega-3 from fish and fish oils are in the form of EPA and DHA. What about vegans? Where do they get their EPA and DHA from? Hmm? Algae, yeah, that's right. Next page, please. That's it, yeah. So, there are algae supplements that you can take, for example. I always say that you should, first of all, get a blood test, see what your omega-3 status is like first, before you consider. Um, but I would, even, even, if you, even if you do have good um, omega-3 status, I would still consider supplementation with um, algae. Because omega-3 has so, omega got so many benefits. How many would you have to eat to kind of get what you're That's the thing. The, 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 we, we don't have the enzyme to convert. So the, what happens is walnuts, they, they have the ALA. You with me? So you've got basically three types of um, omega-3s. You've got the ALA, EPA, and DHA. The EPA and the DHA are the ones that we really want. The ALA is not that great in regards to the benefits. But you tend to find that the walnuts and things like that have a lot of ALA in it but it's the fish that has uh, the EPA and the DHA. But obviously, fish isn't suitable for the vegans, so what we tend to say is, to get the EPA and DHA, you need to have the algae as a supplement. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned B12. Okay, this is, another, this is another very complicated and controversial one, it's B12. Remember in the beginning of the presentation, I talked about all the amazing vitamins that you find in, in vegetables. B12 is the exception to that, okay? B12, you tend to find that in meats and animal products. So, what's the big argument about B12? Who's seen What the Health? What do they say in that documentary? Remember? Um, yeah, the, yeah, that's right. Vitamin B12 makes you feel better, improves your mood. But what is, the, what is the controversial side of it when it comes to veganism? I mean, like, the big argument usually is because they say, like, if you don't eat muscles or if you don't eat meat, you're not going to get B12. Yep. But animals also get it from soil and plants. And it's not like they really get it from the soil. It's just that the stomach and body will convert it into the muscles. And so, obviously, people will take it indirectly from their muscles. So, obviously, we, unless you want to go really, like, next level and start eating soil, mm. you know, like, need to find a different solution. But, 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 but is there a downside between, um, okay, sh I should maybe, rephrase that. Is there, like is there a difference? In meat, it's like, I don't know. Is there a difference between eating B12 from meat and eating B12 from vegetables? Uh, I guess it's a completely different level or not. Because you do find vitamin B12 in certain vegetables. vegetables. I think, is it, on my next, is it on my next slide? And what, one more. Okay. On, one more, one more. Next slide. Yeah, that's it, that's it. So you do find vitamin B12 in certain, like spirulina has vitamin B12. Um, you've got certain soy products have vitamin B12. So it's not that you don't have vitamin B12 in, in, in um, non-animal products. There is a problem though, the vitamin B12 in plants is very difficult to be absorbed by the human body. We can't utilize it very well. So, with it, okay, there's a bit of research going on about chlorella. Some people say that you can eat chlorella and that, but Generally speaking, most vitamin B12 from plant sources aren't absorbed. So vegans really should consider vitamin B12 quite supplements. Now, this is another argument that I hear a lot is, oh, I've been a raw vegan for, for two years and I've had my vitamin B12 levels checked and I'm perfectly fine. Who's ever heard that argument? I've heard that argument around five times. 
Am I the only one who's heard? This this is this is where it gets really confusing. Okay. Vitamin B12 is a very unique vitamin in that, unlike most vitamins, they, we tend to need vitamin B for, vitamin B1, for example, we need it quite regularly. Vitamin B12 stores can stay in our liver for three to five years. Okay, so for three years, you might be vitamin B12 deficient, quote unquote, but you won't actually experience the symptoms of vitamin B12 deficiency for probably three to five years. After that then you'll start to experience the deficiency. If you go back a slide, you'll, which is the, um, the fatigue, the dementia. The, you know that vitamin B12 deficiency is, is like a form of anemia. Um, you mentioned serotonin. Exactly, it reduces, you'll have reduced serotonin to get more depressed. Um, and there's also something called homocysteine, which is associated with coronary heart disease. And vitamin B12 reduces homocysteine levels, hence reduces the chance of heart disease. So. That, I hope that kind of ties, I hope that clarifies the vitamin B12 argument. What sugar is B12 actually in them? Hmm? What foods do you need to eat to have B12? You're talking about, well, animal foods. Mm. Yeah. Food Vegans, uh, as I said, um, not really many. The chlor chlorella argument, they're looking at, uh, they're saying that chlorella is the only one um, at the moment that you might be able to absorb it. So it's not that it doesn't have the vitamin B12, it's just that we can't absorb it as humans. Yeah. But get, get, I say get, get, get a test, get a test, blood test. That, yeah, yeah, I was just wondering if there's any, um, anything you can take to improve the B12 absorption, um, some kind of other foods that would help? Um, not that we know of, not that we know of. And I think that's why, that's why all doc everybody's saying that you should have vitamin B12 supplements as a vegan. Uh, oh, oh, get your levels checked first, get your blood levels checked, because obviously... Okay, um, let's, go. let's go next. Iron. You said about the iron argument. Yeah? Vegans don't have enough iron. You heard that one? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I heard that one. Okay. So what's the truth of it all? Is it true or is it... Okay. The truth is that, again, it's a bit like what I said with the vitamin B12. You do have iron in, in a lot of food, actually. You know, lentils, tempeh, um, pumpkin, and cashews, things like that. Um, very iron rich, but then there's two types of iron. You've got the heme iron and there's a non-heme iron. Yeah? Now in plants, you have something called phytates. Now phytates bond to the iron and they make it really difficult for the human body to absorb it. You heard of the argument? The phytates? So you can eat all the tempeh you want, but if it's bonded to the phytates, it's not really going to be absorbed very easily. The good news is that if you have vitamin C, it helps to break that bond and it makes it easier to absorb the iron. So a lot of people say, have your cashews, have a bit of spinach with it or have some orange with it. Mm. And, and that will help boost the absorption of iron um, and, and, and satisfy your requirements. Same with zinc. Okay? Zinc deficiency in vegans is very common, but it's not very well documented. Okay? Now, what's so good about zinc? Yep, it boosts the immune system. It's really good for testosterone levels. So if you're into bodybuilding, it's something that you've got to take into consideration. Um, well, most people are deficient in zinc, even if they're eating. Absolutely, I was about to say that. Yeah. So, so that, that's a very good point. So again, with, with, the, with the zinc, as opposed to the vitamin C, it's a protein that helps to break that phytate bond. So protein, um, especially protein in meals, as opposed to like individual proteins. But if you're having a protein-rich meal, for example, and, and zinc, uh, that will help to boost zinc absorption. I hope that's making sense. Okay, what's, wait, wait, what's the next one? What, what, what else are ve vegans supposed to be deficient in? Sorry, is the um, tempeh miso like the only two things that you could eat to enhance zinc? Or is that protein. protein. Yeah, protein. Basically, um, uh, with, the, with the exception of casein, but casein isn't really relevant for vegans anyway. But most proteins will actually help boost zinc, zinc, zinc absorption. Okay, so like if I eat legumes or nuts, I should be okay? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Again, get your, get your levels checked, you know, yeah. by, by a doctor. Okay. I was going to say, but yeah, oh, vitamin sorry. D. Vitamin D is a big one, isn't it? Uh, yeah. yeah. But as you, as you said earlier with zinc, vitamin D is, 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 is a deficiency that most people in this country face. Why is that? Because sun. sun. No sun. There's no sun here. There's no sun. <laughs> So I think most people should really consider vitamin D supplementation. Or consider moving somewhere hot. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Move somewhere hot. Oh, yeah. 
Also, you've heard of um, SAD, sunlight affected disorder. A lot of that's, you know, vitamin D is, is, uh, it helps to boost serotonin levels. It makes you feel better and stuff like that. Also, it's very important for testosterone production. So if you're into weight training, vitamin D is very important. D3 to be exact. Is that all making sense? Any questions? Okay, can we move on? Okay, so um, then there's a non-essential one. So we actually produce creatine. You know about creatine? Okay. We actually produce creatine anyway. But again, this is more related to people who are into weight training and exercise. Am I okay for time? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. I'll, I'll, okay, I won't, won't be long. I'll just give me another few minutes. <laughs> so... Um, so this, this is basically the non-essential nutrients. So these are the things that we can actually produce anyway, but we tend not to produce it in as much volume. So creatine, who knows what creatine is good for? Hmm? Now creatine is more for like enhancing sports performance. So um, it's, this is more relevant to... If you actually take too much creatine... Affect your liver. Yeah, obviously too much, too much of anything is never good. Mm. Absolutely. But I think with, with um, I'm, I'm, more, I'm mentioning this mainly because so many people take the creatine. Um, so I think. Mm. So, so when it comes to, when it comes to like, for example, bodybuilding. Now, I talk about, about bodybuilding. <coughs> creatine will, basically, if, who, does, who does weight training? Who goes to the gym? Yeah? Okay. Has anyone taken creatine before? Have you ever found any difference before and after? Um, I noticed I usually put about half a stone of water weight on. Yep. Um, back when I wasn't vegan, it would take me about, I don't know, a few months to lose that weight. Probably because I was topping it up from eating so much chicken and stuff. Um, yeah, so you're, you're getting your creatine from the chicken as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it increased the number of reps I could do generally. Yeah, that's the idea of it. Is that it's supposed to improve, in, in, um, enhance performance mm. and, um, and also hasten recovery as well. Does that mean that you have to take it? Not necessarily. Mm. But if you're into competitive sports or if you really want to take your bodybuilding to another level, then it, it can be a really helpful supplement. Um, as I said, we do produce creatine, but we don't produce as much creatine as meat eaters, for example, or people who are supplementing. Um, do we need it? Not necessarily. Carnosine is another one. Um, who knows about carnosine? It's a bit like creatine. It helps to uh, boost your energy levels in the gym. Now, how many vegans eat muscles and brains? Not many. <laughs> okay. So, obviously, it's, it's not suitable for vegans. Um, and there is, you can't really get effective carnosine supplements. But there's something called beta-alanine. Who's heard of beta-alanine? Beta-alanine improves your energy levels and it helps to make up carnosine. So there are a lot of vegans out there who take beta-alanine to boost the energy levels and also boost recovery um, from a heavy session in the gym. And I think I'm approaching the end. Let's have a look. Oh, taurine. Uh, taurine, mm. don't worry about taurine. Don't worry about it, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> but that's all. Um, if you want to learn more about, uh, I've, I've done other presentations, so feel free to visit my website, leangames.co.uk. Um, if you're interested in my books, then again, you can speak to me afterwards. Are there any questions?